Greetings, it is I, Tantus Naravan Dracovan, your lord and emperor here at the Dracovan Empire, and welcome. Yes, today is another exciting day where we'll be talking about tabletop. Of course, we do this every Tuesday and Thursdays live on twitch.tv slash uh, the Dracovan Empire if you want to join live, or check it out on YouTube once it's uploaded. Either or, we've been going through some great things for the Pathfinder 2nd Edition role-playing game system. If you've missed any of them, Go ahead, go back and watch them. You can see the VODs over at the Twitch.tv uh, channel, the old videos that are saved there, or, again, uploaded to YouTube. Regardless, though, today, though, we're continuing our Ancestry Guide. Last time, what we did is we dove deep into the common ancestries that you could play, but we also dove deep into the variant ancestries. If you remember what we did, oh, the versatile ancestries, as I should say, as they were called, what the versatile and the kind of uh, similarly spoken half-human were are effectively combining two ancestries together in various ways. Uh, the versatile one being an extra bloodline you'd kind of put on top of your uh, already, already existing ancestry, altering it, replacing the uh, common uh, bloodlines that effectively have it, the common um, uh, different versions that you have and uh, her different parts of the heritage. So we've kind of learned a lot about them, but there are a little bit of different things here. Hey, we've talked about these that have existed so far, and yes, you know, there are more heritages to talk about, because uh, there's also more ancestries to talk about. We're gonna hit those uncommon ancestries first, see how far we go in them, see how deep we dive into them, and hopefully get to the rares today. So why don't I throw myself over into the corner as I normally do when we're about to talk about this stuff and open up Archives of Nethys. Again, if you want to use the current um, a PSFR D20, uh, but for the one for Pathfinder 2nd Edition, it is getting better at evolving. But if you're looking for the most information based on, on uh, Pathfinder 1st Edition or 2nd Edition online for free, Archives of Death is the way to go. Second edition is the best place for free online information. And again, this is completely free and offered by Archives of Nethys. You can just go in here, you can see this information. You don't have to have all the books. It's great if you got books like this, if you're ready to use them, but you don't need to. Let's go through these one by one as we kind of did previously and talk about a little bit about, about what they are, what some things you want to know about them, so tell you about a few of their ancestry feats and any of the heritages you might take. So let's start with the uh, Aras, uh, Azar Kenti. So I'll show you pictures of the Azar Kenti here. There's an image of one. There's an image of another one. So these are aquatic humanoids. That's the best, uh, best thing to say that. Um, they're referred to as Gilman or Low Aslanti. Um, their translation of their name is roughly pe people of the sea. Basically, the idea is that after Earthfall, where the Aslanti continent was effectively destroyed and their people, these were people who were mutated by the, uh, you know, our good friends here, the Agalo, uh, Agathulu, which are bum ba bum ba bum ba ba include abolus. Uh So, these mutated them, um, and the thing is, once they got free, it was something of a... Uh, they, they couldn't return it, because they're, they're no longer really connected with their human brethren on the, on the land, and they're no longer connected with the sea as much. They're kind of like in this middle ground, because... They are effectively a version of human that has been altered uh, through dark abilities, mutated, and, you know, also then generations apart. I'll open up the feats here and the heritages while we are here to talk about them. So, yes, a common term people might call them are Gilman. It's not appropriately necessarily inappropriate or anything like that, but... If you want to talk about them with the name they give themselves, the Ars, uh, Azar Kenti uh, is what you want to go. They 
look a lot like people with some different hair colors, uh, little sin scale regs, gills, and things like that, webbed hands and webbed feet. Uh, talks about their society here, how they do have a cultural identity as descendants of the Aslantes, um, and that is an important thing, you know. They try to maintain a little bit of that common culture that they had from the ancient civilization, you know, there. There are still some that serve their ancient dark masters, uh, our good old friends here at the Angalufu. You know, uh, they still serve them, a.k.a. Abolets. It's an unfortunate part of their thing that some do that. Uh, others go into more Adric Adaris. There are plenty that go into the good deities. It's individuals. Um, so, what do we get for them? Well, we get Charisma and Constitution. Charisma and Constitution, Ability Boost, a free one, low light volition, and then Hydration is their ability. That they, um, they require, basically, to be submerged every 24 hours. They've got this, you know skin that, that they dry out it starts having a penalty to them and after 48 hours they begin to suffocate um so they are semi amphibious it, it's it's they're amphibious as long as they are wet you have to think about it as um but that i guess that's like a it's a catch-22 of yeah i'm amphibious but I need to have this water in order to still survive because my body can't dry out in order for me to breathe. Um, a cutoff on the entire thing. So they do have a number of uh, heritages, actually. More than just were in the Ancestry Guide, they had a, a few others that have p popped up here. Um, uh, the base ones, of course, were in here. And a lot of the Absalom City of the Lost Omens uh, comes up with a bunch of different ones. And they give some various bonuses that you can check out uh, from the different ones. There is actually a pretty large heritage amount here for you to choose from. Uh, from the Ancient Scale, the Benthic, uh, we, like the, the Ancient Scale, which um, is kind of like you're more into the deep fathoms you never really connected with the land at all in the first place the benthic which are just better for the deep sea doesn't mean you don't uh, connect up with the land itself unlike the ancient scale um the inert uh which have to do with a lot of poisons and stuff uh mist breath who try to live on land a little bit more um they've got rid of their immersion um, they don't have to be immersed, but they do have to keep their, um, uh, skin still wet, but they can kind of moisten it in order to stay alive, so they, they're slightly better. It means they have to, like, you know, they still need a supply of water. They don't have to, like, dip themselves in the water. They can kind of, like, you know, get in some mist or wipe themselves down in order to survive, and they're a little faster on land. Uh, the murk eyed who have, like, very low visibility areas, rivers who have gone into the inland areas rather than the um, you know, sea uh, spine that have toxic spines, tactile which have a kind of wave sense, and thalassic uh, which are you train, it's like the great oceans, primal magic of the oceans and stuff like that, and you're trying to taste uh, dive into that so there's a lot of various heritages which could some very interesting uh, changes in the way that your character basically works and where they come from for being uh, as Arkebti. Now, as it is for feats, there is a good selection of actual feats here. Um, you know, there's some ones for you get underwater weapons, uh, lore from your own people, um, extensive knowledge of your ancestors' origins, which come from both uh, uh, Agaluthu ore and Aslanti lore, which can be helpful in certain situations. Ones that you are, you know, just, just, just a bound of your uh, uh, Agalothu are a little stronger. Uh, and certain things like Surface Skimmer, uh, Striking Retribution. There's a lot of good feat selections for being that. But it's an interesting character that <clears throat> you're an aquatic character, but you're not the in-depth aquatic character that certainly there are situations that could be. You can spend time on land. You could be in a game that is completely land-based as long as you 
dive yourself into water, or you're the uh, Mistborn. So there's a lot of options for making interesting characters there with that. Cat folk. Let's talk about the cat folk. Um, there we go. There's a cat folk there. We'll get the other cat folk picture here. Uh, there's a couple of cat folks. And of course, let's talk about them. Uh, uh, they are nomadic in a way. They're wanderers. They're kind of the... They are anthropomorphic cat people, as best as you can say it. They are feline people. They are... They like new things. They like little, like, trinkets and stuff. Uh, they're very um, good with... You know, they have family units that they're pretty... Words, and they oftentimes, you know... They have a lot of cat nature in them, but they also have a lot of bravery in them. They, the cat folk do have this like idea that they are guardians of the world. Um, and so they're big on community experience, self-improvement, uh, um, and that they have this place in the hierarchy of the world. Something to mention with these, these are all uncommon uh, ancestors, meaning that they don't show up everywhere, and certainly there are places that they could be unexistent. Um, and they might not have as many numbers as some of the other ancestries. Those other ancestries have a lot of people to them. These might be less. Uh, they all walk off light. They have a long tail, large yields, vertical peoples. They're very feline. Um, they do have short claws that are retractable. Um, and they're very big on maintaining their appearance. Very cat-like. Um, and they do live pretty around the same age as humans. Though, again... Unlike a human, they do walk only a few months old. Uh, they are a little bit better because they are a more, very much more and more nomadic people. Um, and they're about a size of a human, but much leaner. So that gives you an idea. Um, so, there is a name for cat folk that they call themselves. But they consider it the name that they call each other. Uh, Amaroons. So it's like most of them will consider that if you would use that name, you are using something that is one of their terms for each other, uh, that they would use for each other. Some probably wouldn't, but the average cat folk will not bat an eye at you calling them a cat folk, I'm gonna be honest. They have extended families, uh, large ones. Um, they work together to raise their children. Um, and again, they oftentimes will have exposure to those other places as they wander to places. Uh, these groups will have a leader on behalf of the community. Um, and again, spellcaster female are usually the people in charge. Important thing to note there. So, let's talk about what you get as it. Uh, dexterity, charisma, ability boost, free one after that. Wisdom is your flaw. Low lit vision and land on your feet. When you fall, you only take half damage and don't land prone. Pretty simple there. So there's a little bit of stuff here to being a cat folk, honestly. But, you know, we want to talk about what their heritages are. Because there is a pretty decent selection of heritages here, as you can see. Similarly, a lot of these ones here have not only had the Advanced Player's Guide, things like the Ancestry's Guide that give them. Uh, the Clawed one uh, makes it you uh, your claws are big enough that you have, like, actual attacks. Like, yeah, I've got retractable claws. Can't really do, like, super big damage on them. Now I can. Uh, Flexible's good at squeezing through areas. Uh, hunting, you have a bit of a sense of smell. It's imprecise, imp uh, imp imprecise scent, and you can track a little bit. Jungle, you're adaptive for being in the jungle area. Uh, the liminal, this is an interesting one because uh, you've kind of been on the boundaries of the world. Remember, they are protectors of the world. They deal with this crap. You know, that's their entire idealism as a as a ancestry is they protect the world. So of course connecting with those boundaries of the world that can have dangers, you know, the boundaries of reality is one that some do. Of course, nine lives, uh, you know, uh, if there's times that you, uh, you know, can live longer. Um, basically, if you're reduced to zero hit points from a critical hit on an attack roll, you get dying one instead of dying two. Uh, it's harder to kill you, a little bit. Uh, sharp eared you get bonuses to, uh, you know, hearing and stuff, and winter, you're good in the cold area. A lot of these are pretty self-explanatory when it comes to heritages, and that's the good thing a lot about heritages, is that you can kind of easily explain how they are different and how they work different just a little bit. Some of them might be similar, uh, like with the previous one here, but most of them are generally different. Hey, cat folk, catnap! Uh, 
Once per hour, by sleeping 10 minutes, you can gain temporary hit points equal to the your level for that last 10 minutes. Take a cat nap. Get some extra luck. Uh, a dance. Um, that you can have abilities. Lore of your own people. Saber teeth that you have a bite attack. Um, and things like that for your first level. And, you know, there's like things like the Winter Cat Folk Heritage has a bunch of Winter Cat scents and stuff like that. So, so again, some heritages have extra bonuses. And you can see Cat Folk's Luck has a lot of other feats uh, built into it. So if you want to go and have a Cat Folk Luck build on your ancestry, you certainly can. And, you know, look, yo, hey, look, Focus Cat Nap. You get re so bonuses for these. So, again... There's a pretty good selection of ancestry feats here that some of them base on others, uh, kind of build on top of them. Um, so yeah, and so that's that's our cat folk, um, a uh, an ancestry that's a very interesting one, a species of beings that, uh, you know, it, it tends to be, again, because they are, you know, travelers, wanderers, and lot, you know, with these family groups that they build into, very interesting. Let's talk about the Fetchlings, because uh, Fetchlings are those that have the Shadow Plains uh, influence. Basically, these were human uh, at one time, but with generations of the Shadow Plane influencing them, they've become an entirely different humanoid species. Uh, as you can see from the pictures, they've got a very drained color, uh, they, uh, you know, grays, blacks, darks, uh, these kind of, like, glowing red eyes represent, uh, what fetchlings are. Um, so, these are very similar to our last group, one of our last groups we're talking about, the, uh, uh, Azarkenti. Fetchlings are of Aslantian origin. They beg to be rescued from the basically end of the world from Earthfall, and a hooded figure took them to the Plane of Shadows. Um, and being on the Plane of Shadows, they changed. They became something different. And over thousands of years, they became the Fetchling. Um, influenced by the Plane of Shadows and becoming a native to it after generations. And the thing is... It's the plane of shadows is in the to not get deep into the cosmology of it all. It's like an altered version of material plane, but without color. So very much so, fetchlings represent it. It feels very monochromatic, and they feel like humans in a way, though drained of color. And they've got these pupilless eyes that pierce the darkness that are reflective. Um, you know, so in a way, fetchlings do look a lot like humans. Um, and they have their societies that they've built uh, and culture, some in the material plane, some in the shadow plane, but they keep together with themselves. So those that have come back to the material plane and returned still maintain close bonds with each other and kind of have their, their basic cultural together. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about some of these things here when we talk about some things in a second, but you can take a look at a little bit more information here. They get Dexterity as an ability boost and one free one. So they're pretty simple there. Um, and they get Dark Vision. So they don't have two ability boosts and a flaw. They just have an ability boost and a free one. They get Dexterity and a, and a free. Um, then let us look at their heritages and then their feats. Heritages. There's a few here. Again, they're all from the Ancestry Guide that they were uh, kind of fun guys. Um, so... You know, bright um, is that you emit some dim light. The idea is that shadow can't exist without light. Shadow is not darkness. Shadow is not the absence of light. Shadow is the lack of a lot of light. So the idea is that this is one that, um, you know, gains some abilities to, you know, you can concentrate to get rid of it, but you can produce a bit of light. And they get some uh, in innate cantrips you can cast there. Which is pretty cool. You cast Dancing Lights and Light. Um, those that are deep fletchlings came from the most deepest, most dangerous, most treacherous regions of the Shadow Plane. Um, and kind of embrace a lot more of that darkness. They, they get, you know, some cold or negative energy resistance. You choose that. Uh, of course, hey, Liminal. 
we talked about liminal previously it's the realms in between uh, and this is another one because of the nature of how close the ethereal and shadow planes are and the borders of it these are fetchlings that are from that kind of area where those two realms begin to intermix and meet with each other and so they're feeling that same boundaries of reality in a way and have had an effect on them over generations um so resolute fetchlings you got mental fortitude you from wherever you are, Shadow Plane or elsewhere, have just had a lot of shit happen to you, honestly. And so they've just got this bigger mental fortitude they've built up by dealing with the constant crap of wherever they are that over tries to overwhelm them. And they just build that up. The Wisp, on the other hand, are ones that have had more physical change from exposure to the Shadow Plane. It has done more to them. They're skin and hair are a little bit more insubstantial you're slightly more agile than your average fetchlings notice this here you're small instead of medium this is what's happened to you is that the this is the most extreme example of exposure to the energies of the shadow plane has caused a very massive change in the witch wisp fetchlings maybe in a few hundred generations they could be their own thing separate from other fetchlings uh, a different type of fetchling, a different, a different ancestry. Who knows that if this change could continue if they're on your own because of their various exposure has definitely had a change in them that is very rapid and massive in comparison to the changes you already had from becoming a fetchling. For fetchling feats, of course, lore is usually a big one of their uh, shadow blending. Um, you can draw shadows around you to kind of conceal yourself a little bit better. Uh, slink, you're a bit be better at hiding in the darkness, things like that. Uh, so it's a lot of very stealthy based abilities. Uh, there's a, a cult con trip over here that might work very well if you're the liminal uh, fetchling. Uh, have a little bit of more occult magic that might explain that. Or you could have just picked it up from being in the shadow plane or having that ancestry from it. So there's a little bit of that occultness, that uh, stealthness that can go into when you're using your ancestry feats and building it, and building your building it. But again, you can always just go for your lore. It's always a fine one to to take, and you know, some obscure. Um, and the thing is, the fetchling lore gives you training in occultism and stealth, and you become trained a skill of your. Uh, if you have already one of them, um, you get trained of a skill of your choice, and you're also trained in shadow plane lore. So, hey, Shadow Plane lore may not come up, but you get a cultist and stuff. Will those be critical to your character? If I'm a fetchling fighter, no, but they could come up. They could come up and I could roll them, because I've trained them already. And honestly, I could, again, this is the big thing about uh, Pathfinder 2e. When I get my uh, expertise or my mastery or my uh, legendary status, I could put them into there if I, if I want to. I could dive deeper into these. Stealth fighter, certainly be one. That's our fetchlings. Those that have been hit by the uh, Shadow Pain. Let's talk Knolls. Alright, uh, Knolls. Uh, good old Knolls here. They are best described as hyena people. So, um, again, as we talk about uncommonness and commonness and stuff like that, we're talking Galarian. And uh, in the lands of the East, such as uh, Kapatish, Knolls earn themselves a reputation as brutal slavers and demon worships. Um, in the Woggy Expanse, they've got these, like, bad kind of reputation, too. The Mongi Knolls uh, know themselves as the Kolo. Um, they're practical, charismatic hunters and raiders. Um, those are kind of the ones that you'd probably want to, like, play as. Um, honor's pointless risk, you know, um... You know, any loss to Null affects not the individual, but the pack makes and kid. That's the idea, is being honorable, being risky, not great, because if you die, it is affecting your entire family. Um, you know, and that's why, like, the mercilessness and the cruelty that can kind of be seen there is not actually mercilessness and cruelty, especially in these Mwangi Nulls. It's practicality. Um, it's like they don't go for m morality. They kind of, like... It's all about victory. They shy away from that morality because it might be a little too much. But, like, you know, 
the practicality of their existence is what it is. It's they're very set in those ways, and that can kind of like um, put that way. And so, like, yes, there are gnolls in other parts of the world, but the ones that your characters are probably going to be are the longy gnolls, honestly. Um, and again, the practice of ancestor worship and uh, endo cannibalism. Um, gnolls consume their dead as a sign of reverence, holding grand feasts and transforming the bones of the fallen into art and weapons. You eat your dead as a part of a ritual. You know, the, their you know strength goes into your family uh, and, and into it. So again very alien rituals in comparison to a lot of rituals that most of the uh, other humanoid species, most of the other ancestries, especially common ones in Galarian, go for. And it's some of the reasons that there is these idealisms that make, you know, gnolls looked at badly. And yes, the Kapatish, the Eastern gnolls, are demon worshippers and brutal slavers. There is a large group of them that are that way. But it's not all the gnolls. And you could have come from that community and been like an exile, certainly. You could work out a thing with your GM about that. But again, like the Mwangi gnolls are probably where you're going to keep. Um, anyway, um, they're very, you know, they're hyena people. That's the best way to describe it. Uh, <laughs> they, they, you know, uh, women are a little taller than men uh, and a little stronger, actually. Um, they stand between six and seven feet tall. Um, so, yeah, and they talk about the Colo Society, which are really the ones that, uh, you're going to look at here. Um, anyway, and, uh, you know, you could leave as a mercenary or adventurer, um, bringing back to your people. Um, maybe you were left orphaned or something that you don't have a clan, uh, or you were exiled. These are very good reasons to do it. And they are pack-minded. So the thing is, you're very good at adopting friends to, as basically honorary gnolls and packmates. So that's what you kind of think is, that's one of the important things is like, the nature of a gnoll is that you are very, you know, you have your family. Now, are you doing something to help your family? Or do you not have that family and your adventuring group is your adopted family? And, you know, that's the question you have to kind of ask because that's like a natural instinct for your uh, group. So strength, intelligence, and free for ability, wisdom, further flaw, low light vision, and you get a bite. Um, you know, you get a bite. Uh, let's talk heritages and feats. All right, heritages. There's ant gnolls. You're small instead of medium. They're a smaller group of. Uh, they're they're a. I guess the proper term would be a pygmy group. Of gnolls, as pygmies are a type of uh, humans, I believe. If I'm incorrect on that, someone please correct me. Um, if that is the correct term for it, I cannot remember because I know that you've heard the term before for used for, you know, uh, smaller tribes of people um, that have ended up being that way. Pygmy is the proper term for it. But anyway, you are a smaller, um, actually small sized, and gain some bonuses from that. Uh, great gnoll, you're bigger than your average gnoll. Um, again, all these are from the Mwangi Expanse. The idea is if you're playing a gnoll, you're really playing a Mwangi gnoll. Um, because they're the ones without the demon worship and the slavery. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, a sweet breath gnoll. Um, and you give off a pleasant smell to entrace uh, your prey. Gives you bonuses to make an impression. And there's a feat like that. And of course, uh, the witch knoll, you can make some weird sounds. You get ghost sound as a uh, innate occult cantrip. Um, and, you know, get some, like, cackling and stuff like that. As for knoll feats, hey, we got them! Again, it's the Milwaukee Expanse book. Uh, pack Hunter, you know how to pack, uh, hunt as a pack. Sensitive nose, you're a little bit better at scent. You get a hyena familiar, um, because hyenas, you're a hyena person, you get a tiny hyena as a familiar. You get like a, you know, uh, little hyena. Your weapons for your for your people, lore, and your bite's a little bit better. Uh, a lot of interesting uh, feet directions for there. 
it's an interesting thing that you would play something that, like, as much as, like, you know, oh, goblins were originally, you know, in a lot of older fantasy games, monsters. And in this one, it's saying that, yeah, there are plenty of goblins in Galarian who are still very violent and tribal, but many of them are beginning to kind of find their way into the Galarian society as a whole. They have problems, as a lot of those, you know, dark natures are still there, but again, a lot of their things are a lot more understandable than what the gnolls have their way of doing things. Again, it's that practicality that ends up being very cruel, because again, like, um, if, think of it this way, if they go to war with a, let's say, a human settlement in the Mongi Expanse, and, you know, practicality is just kill them all off. That's the practicality of it. It makes it easy. They don't have to worry about fighting a member again. You know, is if they win, just kill the rest of them. And probably eat them, because that's a lot of extra meat. You know, again, practicalities. So the idea of cannibals and stuff there, and the idea of cannibals comes from their uh, endo cannibal, consuming their dead and stuff like that. Which is things like their thing is there. It's, again, that seems cruel. It seems merciless. You know, but it ends up being this practicality. Um... And again, a lot of what they do, it doesn't near give them to their neighbors. It's a reason that they're looked upon in a very bad way. And they're cousins who, you know, demon worshippers and slavers. Um, that's Knowles. Gripply, believe it or not. I'm going to make that joke so many goddamn times. Gripply are frog people. That's the easiest way to say it. You are a group of frog-based humanoids. Uh, they are treetop folks, you know. Um, they're mis misconstrued as primitive because they rely on simple tools and cunning. Um, but um, they, you know, hide a lot of that material in the way they do things. And they do trade with the outside world. Um, but again, like, it's like because they only need simple tools. And, you know, they're just being very big ambush people because of their small stature and their nature makes them kind of look down upon. And they are not a primitive people. That's the that's thing you have to think about. It. So they are basically humanoid tree frogs. Um, and uh, they are excellent climbers. They aren't big. They're a small species. Uh, and, you know, they there are some that live up to be a century old, you know, so they have a long lifestyle. You might reach adult uh, at three years as a gripply. That's pretty young, but you know you're a small species that are amphibian humanoids. You grow up a lot differently. And, you know, uh, well, they get a full size, I should say. Adult size at three, considered an adult at 12. That, that's what I should say. You are your proper size at three, you're an adult at 12 when your society accepts you. Again, similar to elves, where they have a age you're an adult at age which your society pretends you're an adult. Uh, f physically, seemingly an adult. You know, those are two different things for a species. When do I physically reach my maximum? When do I societally reach my maximum? Um, or, you know, adulthood, I should say. Um, they're technically hunter-shaper, but they reshape the landscape to their needs. Uh, spillways trap feet, uh, seeding trees, uh, that are uh, fruit bearing trees, uh, you know, giving special foliage for hunts, you know. An agriculturist would escape this thing because they're not going for agriculture the way we think of it. They are altering the landscape in a way to their needs. They are hunter gatherer, but they make things easier by doing things that sound like would be levels of agriculture. I mean, like, think about it. We seed fruit bearing trees. Okay, I don't make a farm out of them. I put them in various places. Uh, spillways for, for fish to get trapped in. You know, um, special foliage for, for hunts. You know, uh, and these are community corporations. Um, and so, like, you know, alliances of Gripley will work together in, in various villages to do all this. So you're small, dexterity, wisdom, free, strength is your flaw, and they get low light vision. Let's talk Gripply Heritages and Gripply Feats. So, Gripply Heritage. Poison Gripply. You're a poison dark frog. You have deadly skin. 
pretty easy as that. You gain a uh, Toxicin reaction. Um, pretty simple. Uh, sharp tongue. Um, your tongue is very... Oh, snap tongue. Your tongue is especially long and launch it with extreme... Basically, you get the long frog tongue. Um, you can do stuff with it. Um, and there are some feats that require that you have uh, the snap tongue ripply. Sticky toes. You climb on surfaces a little bit better than your average ones. Uh, average Gripply. You're a little bit better than, you know, the average Gripply at climbing up in places because of your sticky toes. And, of course, uh, a Wind Web Gripply, um, which, um, e the webbing between your hands and toes can slow a fall, as long as you have a fan face. Um, you know, um, a little silly sounding, um, but, you know, your webbing, you can basically break your fall with it. Um, so, you know, it's an ad adaptation that uh, some Gripply have. And the Gripply Fates basically, hey, there's uh, the wet web whip ones. Uh, you can now guide your fall, or Gripply Guide, and stuff like that at 5th level. Uh, jungle Strider, you're better at moving through the jungle. Hunter's defenses, uh, better at fighting in the, you know, as a hunter. Weapons, lore, and Nocturnal, you're a little better. You get dark vision. Um, so... They do say Doctrinal Gripply is a first-level feat that you can take. It's your choice if you want to take it. Some have been adapted to fighting in the, uh, doing stuff in the dark. So Gripply, they're kind of fun. Um, they have interesting ancestries, interesting hand, uh, heritages, and they're fun characters. And again, if we're talking adventurers, um, they can be from these remote regions, and some could have accustomed themselves to urban areas. You know, things about being an emissary from a Gripply tribe could be a reason that you ended up in a place. And they do have a, you know, there's a lot of classes that work perfectly fine for them. Just, you know, think about it. And backgrounds, too. Um, there are ones that are more adapted to societally and culturally. But really, you know, any that you want to would be appropriate, as it is for most of these. They just tell you when it's adventurers is what your traditional one ends up being that becomes an adventurer. Connection to nature, druids and rangers. They've got a big music tradition, bards. You know, uh, agility, perceptiveness, clerics, monks, rogues. They have religion and stuff, like, too. Uh, you know, so all these are very easy classes to call for, it, but you can be really happy for most of these. They kind of suggest that. Hobgoblins. So, there's a hobgoblin there. Uh, and there's a hobgoblin there. They look a lot like goblins. They are a goblin type species. Um, but they're sized bigger as big as a human. And they have very like long arms. Uh, you know, the thing is they've had a uh, they've had reputation, um, as very militaristic, as very warlike, as very oppressive. Uh, but Opark, the Goblin Nation recently established, has kind of, like, upended that. Um, they ceased to desist them, claimed this area as their homeland, and sought peace with their neighbors. Basically, Iron Fang Legion, this large group of hobgoblins. Um, so now, order, under these strict orders to not cause conflict with other nations. Um, and so they've been kind of cautiously investigating the Avastian uh, in, as cooperation. Uh, and the Iron Fan Legion had done some pretty cruel thing. You know, is it a lot of questions about it? And the Whispering Tyrant's still out there. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons that, hey, there was this warlike nature of hobgoblins that they were always very against other ancestries, against other species out there, always warring against them. But now a new nation of hobgoblins has been established that's trying for peace. That's one of those things that's kind of like, it's changing the nature of it. So a hobgoblin character seems more reasonable. You're about as tall as humor, uh, tend to have sh uh, shorter legs, longer arms, and torsos. They're bald, have uh, beady eyes, gray skin, uh, sometimes with blue tans. Uh, and they're hardy. That's a big thing about hobgoblins. They're hardy. Um, they're very militaristic, too. 
they have a, a, a even in, in amongst their like civilian divisions, they have this very strict hierarchical position and uh, social status on everything. And punishments tend to be social demonstrations, execution, slavery are common for serious crimes, though. Um, hey, they're militaristic. Desertion is a serious crime. Veterans of military are pretty big in their society, too. Um, magic isn't seen as very well. The sword arms trusted more the, the magical arm. Uh, art also tends to be military bent, you know. Uh, string marches and weapon smithing, the only artific as, uh, you know. Orpax, peace has been changing some of all this stuff, though. So it's sort of like the hobgoblin nation is with peace being enforced is kind of changing their society a little bit it's still on the fringes that things could occur so that's the thing is you know because of the strict hierarchy military hierarchy you're going to get through a lot of excellent adventures happen this way many are being warriors or their martial disciplines um if you're raised away from your people there could be reasons by it um you know there is this martial mindset, um, you know, and elf or uh, hobgoblin magic does exist. It's very rare and shunned by their people. Might be a reason why you're an adventurer if I'm a hobgoblin wizard or sorcerer or something. Um, though again, they do say clever ones could become alchemists, so that kind of skates around the edge of it. But again, um, as a hobgoblin, and if I practice magic, Maybe that's why I left there. Uh, you know, it's like you could tell people, it's like, I'm here because I'm an exile. I am, I'm shunned by my people, you know. Um, my ability to learn these things and want to learn these things, to become a wizard, to become whatever, has driven me away from my people, you know, uh, because of that. So you get constitution, intelligence, and a free, and wisdom as your flaw, and you get dark fishing. Those are the big things you get as a hobgoblin. But let's talk about hobgoblin heritages and their feats. So, guess what? Elves and hobgoblins have not gotten along a lot. So, uh, the idea is hobgoblins were created uh, from goblins to fight elves. Um, that's that's where their one of their origins kind of, like, their origin kind of is. Um, the elves freed them from their bondages. You know good some of them notice here they're still like in their ancestry there's you know some still have that grudge against elves because of this you know hey my people were ex ex uh, enslaved and in, 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 enslaved and changed to kill you you freed us from our masters we still don't like you because you probably were in you know, it's like they might blame them as being instrumental in causing this war which caused the side to escalate. It's not a good thing to blame, but they could exist. Anyway, some are resistance to magic. They refer to it as elf magic. You know, it ends up being uh, against magic in general. They just call it arcane effects. Um, or more arcane than anything else. Um, front boss. You come from a long line of goblins that commanded... Uh, hobgoblins that commanded goblins. You're a little smaller... Um, but goblins still listen to you. Uh, you know, you get bonuses, uh, to coerce a goblin. That's it. Uh, short shank hobgoblins. Uh, longer toes or broader shoulders. Uh, making your legs short, less short by comparison. Um, you get bonuses in, uh, riding and some with climbing and stuff, you know. Uh, you were taught because of that. Smoke worker hobgoblin. Hey, family of alchemists. Alchemists don't count the same way as other spellcasters. Hey, alchemists, you know, that's what you maybe you're encouraged from instead of becoming a wizard. And, you know, uh, you get fire resistance and stuff there. Steel skin, um, you know, uh, it's the same way that they're very hardy and they recover a lot. This is where the, this kind of comes in that, like, you know, you recover from damages and stuff a lot easier. Uh, War March Hobgoblin. Uh, you come from a line of uh, mercenaries, constantly on the march and scavenging the road. You're better at subsisting, and you can hustle longer. And of course, war and bread, uh, your ancestors live underground. Uh, and you get bonuses when you're underground. 
So there's a lot of interesting ideas for Hobgoblin heritages. And again, there's plenty of characters that could be a good reason for you to leave your society. Maybe you're a deserter who left ho the Hobgoblin lands because you didn't want to get killed because guess what deserters get? Nyah. So, again, a lot of. Hey, Hobgoblins, again, make great alchemists. There's a ancestry feat for alchemists. You learn formulas uh, more easily. It's a first level one. You get your lore, weapon familiarity. Uh, Tui. We are talking Tui. And again, uh, you know, sneaky, stone face, vigorous health. You're a little bit more robust. So a lot of these feats, again, play up to the hobgoblin's natural abilities as being kind of a little, like, uh, stronger. And stealth is important. Again, like, something that we didn't talk about that, you know, hobgoblins are military tacticians. But the thing is, they understand that, hey, the ambush is a really great military tool. If I ambush it with a bunch of soldiers it's probably pretty good to take advantage of stuff like that. You know, uh, uh, lawful does not mean, mean stealthy and, and trickery at some times. Uh, does not mean that it isn't. But uh, that's the idea of what you're going to play as a hobgoblin, um, if you want to go that route and, you know, play one. Uh, they are much more in Galarian of Pathfinder 2nd Edition, uh, one that has much more of a reason to play one. Not that you couldn't have played one in first edition, but similar to like a lot of these uncommon ancestries, the evolution of the Galarian world is allowed, and like ways that it's kind of changed throughout the time period of first edition has allowed this enough of a changes for a lot of these societies to alter in certain ways. Let's talk Kitsune. Hey, the Kitsune. Uh, we'll take some look at the pictures of the Kitsune here. Um, that's in their human form. They're shape changers. One is, of course, a fox person. Um, and uh, the other one is a humanoid, kind of depending on where they were raised. That's the kind of thing. Uh, um, you know, it's usually a humanoid body without any fox features um, that resembles a common ancestry, kind of like an elf, a human. Um, and the thing is, sometimes that second form is a fox especially in rural and wooded areas so it's sort of like if i'm a katsuna that was raised along with other species i will tend to have my shape-shifting second form as a humanoid if i'm off in like a rural wooded area with just a few like family members maybe i change into a fox um the thing is they have their own settlements but most of the time they live with others. That's the thing. is because they have a dual nature and a shape-changing ability and this connection between both spiritual and material worlds, they have this very diverse identity. And again, like, you have your own culture, but you're very good at working your own culture into uh, with other species and, and uh, connecting up with them. Um, they're, they're one form, again, fox. Fox person. The easiest way to describe it. You know, a mixture of a fox and people. Um, and again, Katsune tend to not be a majority in any communities they exist in. Um, so their groups that they have in amongst those communities are the commonalities that they have. So sort of like, I'm a Katsune in this city. Um, uh, my group of Katsune, I would know about them, family. We might have a community amongst themselves. We might not all live together. But we have a community and amongst themselves that, you know, has relationships and social connections. Beyond any social connections I might make with the rest of this people in the city. Because it doesn't mean I can't get along with them. I just have a much stronger connection with my own family, too. Um, and again, Kitsune make great adventures. Um, you know, and there's, a, you know, there's those that strike out on their own. Um, and they have magical abilities often. So they have kind of ideas of what they are. And for society, if you're playing Kitsune, you get charisma and a free one. So no uh, flaw for Kitsune, Lodlet Vision, and you get your chain shape. So, yeah, your heritage kind of determines what form you take. Um, you know, and we'll talk about that in a second. But it's really going to be your heritage here, which let's click on the heritage here and talk about it uh, here for your ones that we have. 
Celestial Envoy Kitsune. They have a connection to the Divine. Uh, you get this invoked Celestial uh, Reaction. Your alternate form is a common medium humanoid ancestry uh, around where you grew, grew up. Typically human. It's your tailless form. But you get this, like, ability here. Bonus to saving throw is against a Divine effect. You haven't rolled. You know. The Dark Field Kitsune, um, which... Uh, you got an unsettling premise to demoralize people, basically. Um, your alternate form is a fox. There you go. And you basically are... Um, you make people frightened. The Earthly Wilds Kitsune. Um, you're a creature of the material world, but you're less, more wild than urban. You get a jaw attack, you can bite things. Alternate form is a fox. Empty Sky Kitsune. Um, you get these secret Kitsune magic... Uh, the Kitsune spell uh, familiarity ancestry feat, you get it automatically. Um, and then uh, you get a humanoid as your tailless form. And similarly, Frozen Wild a Wind Kitsune, uh, they're from the crown of the world and from the snowy peaks. You're basically, you know, from a cold area. Again, uh, you get that uh, human form for your tailless form. So let's look at Kitsune spell familiarity uh, because uh, honestly, it's on here. And any Kitsune can take it. That means I could have been any of those other ancestry heritages and take Kitsune Spell Familiarity. I get it for free from one of them as part of my build, and I could take something else. But you can see uh, Retractable Claws, you get a Call Attack, you get the Lore, which gains you Diplomacy and Deception. Foxfire, you can create this little like bit of electricity. The Spell Familiarity, which you get some... Um, um, during your daily penetrations, you can choose a cantrip as a divine innate spell. So there's a lot of things you can do. And you can get deep, deep dive into Kitsune magic, too, uh, the more you want to. And there are, are actually things for, for doing that, for getting deeper into Kitsune magic, uh, which would be kind of cool. But that's a Kitsune there. Um, shape changers. Maybe you have a fox form, maybe you have a human form. It depends on what kind of Kitsune you are. And uh, honestly, you know, then... Um, I just want to check something here for Kitsune Feats. Sorry, I just want to check something because I thought of something. Uh, oh, there it is. And you could always take uh, Myriad Forms. Um, see? Um, you can get a Fox Form, basically. You can alter Forms Kitsune Heritage other than your own. Now, granted, the way they say this means I could get a secondary humanoid form if I really didn't, I wanted to. Let's just click on this instead of see this. Uh, you know, the way they say this, I would allow that. A secondary humanoid form. But really what it's supposed to be is you can, if you're a fox, you can also go humanoid. If you're humanoid, you can also go fox. That, that's really the myriad forms it's supposed to be. So, that, you know. It, it, it's, uh, and look, see, Taylor's alternate form, Shifting Faces, you know, that's the other one. So it's sort of like this one, you really want to take it for Fox. Shifting Faces is really if you're Taylor's and you want a bunch of humanoid forms. This is if I'm a Fox and want a humanoid or a humanoid and I want a Fox. So there is a better feat for that, but I'm not saying you couldn't do it that way. There's just a better feat for it. And I just, I was, I thought there was something like that. There was something like that in Pathfinder First Edition, so I just wanted to make sure that I remembered correctly that they added it in. Cobalt! Ba -bum 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 -bum. Everybody's favorite powerful dragony folks. Oh, reptilians. They have great draconic powers in their bloodlines. They, of course, are... Um, Oftentimes, uh, like, guardians of um, uh, dragons and stuff like that. Scavengers. And they have this draconic revenants that they kind of look up to dragons. And there are those that have emerged from these secluded Warringtons and gone to surface settlements. Uh, joining adventuring life. Uh, you know, finding followers of their own. Things like that. And, you know, the ancient power of dragons goes through your veins. They're three foot tall reptilian humanoids, long tails, slender bodies. They boast of draconic ancestry and oftentimes have draconic feats. You know, horns, teeth, uh, wings, stuff like that, dragon breath. Um, 
Their colors can vary uh, along with both metallic and chromatic dragon colors, and some that appear like mixtures or difference. Um, a, long a lot of times, the uh, hatch kobolds reflect the community's Drictronic Exemplar, uh, whether it's they currently serve a dragon or the dragon form that they say they're descended from. That's kind of the way that you kind of figure that out. And they've been in great cautiousness to keep them alive. They're secretive, they're so very subservient, um, but they don't want to become victims, you know? That's the entire thing, is they're not about becoming victims. They're about, you know, getting by, you know? It's like, oh, I don't want to be a victim of this powerful creature. I will serve you, you know? That kind of thing. And uh, they do have loyalty. The thing is, they do have a sense of loyalty. Um, but they also have an infamous saying, uh, inf they're, they're infamous from sensing when a ship is sinking. And if your source of power is failing or doomed, uh, they will leave. So it's their loyalty, as long as, you know, you're not losing and going down. They can sense when that happens. You know, and again, dragons tend to be something that they serve a lot. Um, there's a lot of reasons for kobolds to leave and go out on their own, you know? Um, plenty to reason behind it, and there's a lot of good kobold options. So you get Dex and Charisma and a free boost, and Constitution is your flaw. You get Dark Vision, and you get a Draconic Exemplar. Um, it's the, dra the Draconic power you drain your minor abilities from. Um, you choose a Chromatic or Metallic Dragon to be your Exemplar. It's your scale color, your appearance, um, and a lot of times, you know, dragons will look more favorably of that type upon you. Uh, sometimes, depending on the dragon. And some abilities might be linked to that, uh, depending on what you kind of choose. Like a nice table there. Let's take kobold heritages and kobold feats and talk about them. Cave climber kobold! Got a very vertically enter uh, oriented home where you're living underground. You're a much better climber. And that's it. You get better at climbing because you're in a place that's like that. A cavern kobold. Um, you hatch in a warren along narrow tunnels and countless kids. It's the idea that, like, okay, the clay climb, you're a vertical one. This one is your very small areas that are, like, you know, tunnels and very, you know, there isn't a lot of area. You're kind of squished in there. You're a little bit more flexible because of it. Uh, dragon scale. Hey! Uh, you've got resistances to the same to the dragon uh, that your exemplar is. Breath. Uh, you know, double this against dragon's breath weapons. You're resistant to dragon's breath weapons. But if your dragon, your exemplar is, is like fire, you have fire protection, that kind of thing. Spell skill, you've got some arcane magic through you from like uh, experience of, uh, you know, dragon magic in you. Get an arcane uh, cantrip. And you know it as an innate will at cantrip. Strong draw, you're good at biting stuff. Um, you t uh, Tunnel flood kobold. Hey, wherever you're living underground, eh, you know, your people were in an area, there are just flooded areas of it. Um... You, you, you learn to sw your people learn to swim. And those of them that have, uh, you know, a uh, venom tail, they've got a spur on their tail that's poisonous. Let's talk kobold feats. Very interesting sets of kobold bears. Um, cringe. <laughs> you, you just go, oh, oh, you know, you cringe away at stuff, uh, you know, and you can basically <laughs> cause someone to pull back, uh, you know. Uh, draconic presence, you know, you could be like all dragony. Uh, <laughs> you get a breath weapon, uh, lore, familiarity of weapons, scampering, uh, basically to flee, uh, slithering, go through tight spaces. Uh, winglets over here, um, you get gross set of like kind of wings that help you out. I don't know if you develop into full wings or they're just for like, um, uh, yeah, you got a wormling flight. Oh, Hatchling Flight is the first one. Okay, so you do gain more developed uh, ones. You can eventually fly a little. They start out you can just glide with some wings. And you could take it that you get flight. Honestly, your Draconic Wings develop and you can, like, fly around if you want to be a flying kobold. But kobolds are kind of fun to play. Uh, you know, you're outside of your family, of your underground for a reason. And honestly speaking, kobolds aren't really seen as, like, pests or, like, dangerous a lot of times. They work for dragons a lot. Both good and evil, you know, honestly. Um, and uh, outside of society, they can earn their way, you know. Uh, and some live in human societies too. 
Cobalt. Another fun one to play. Ooh, Leshy. Leshy are best described as adorable. There's a little cactus Leshy. There's a little plant Leshy. There's another one. Oh, look at that. Uh, oh, look at that guy. Your plant. <laughs> They're emissaries and guardians of the environment. They're immortal spirits. Uh, they've been granted temporary physical form. You have to think about it. They're normally born when a skilled druid or a master of primal magic conducts a ritual to create a suitable vegetable. Their spirit chooses the vegetables their temporary home. They're self-sufficient the moment the material ends, so they do not depend on the druids for care. Um, it's not uncommon for these leshies to stay with their creators for life. Um, not all leshies have strong enough spirit to strike off their own completely. Weaker nature spirits, uh, you know, uh, can only form tenuous bonds that are strong enough just to animate tiny bodies. They become leshy familiars. So there are t two types of leshies. You know, you it's the idea that leshies are created the same, but what that same difference is, there's tiny ones which end up being familiars because they don't have as much strength, or the ones that you as a player will be with your vaguely humanoid form with plant or fungus characteristics that are about their small size. You're created through a ritual. Your spirit. You don't age. Uh, you know. Um, they could remain in their vessel forever. Leshies don't really desire that per se. Because again, you're technically a spirit in a vessel. I'm just blow up my dogs here. Every time I do one of these episodes, it always seems like my nose runs a little bit more. Guardian Leshies can congregate. Traveling Leshies aren't really drawn to their own kind. They don't have society the same way because they are a nature spirit. It doesn't mean that like they can't connect them with each other. It just is like, again, they're very natural world. They gravitate towards that. But, um, you know, there is a lot more for them to go. Um, more suitable backgrounds. You could be pretty much anything still. You know, maybe you're a Leshy that took this direction. So, Constitution Wisdom as your ability boost. Free one. Intelligence as your flaw. Get low light version and plant nourishment. Um, so yeah. Um, combination of photosynthesis and absorbing uh, minerals through your roots or scavenging decaying material. Uh, you don't have to pay for food. You normally rely on photosynthesis without going for sun... Uh, with, uh, and go for without sunlight for a week before beginning to starve. Um... You can derive energy from specifically formulated bodies of sunlight uh, instead of natural sunlight. Um, bottles of uh, sunlight. Um, but they cost very expensive. Um, so basically, go for a week without sun. Or if you're in the sun, you're fine. You can buy bottles of sun, which are very expensive for rations. Ten times the cost of normal rations. But again, they can sustain you for like a week for these magical bottled sunlight or uh, chemical bottled sunlight. It gives you for a week. It only costs basically, you know, three days more worth the price. A little plant person. The type depends on where you're going for. I gotta be honest, it's exactly what it sounds like. Hey, hey, what kind of leshy am I? I'm a cactus leshy. I got spines all over my body. You can pierce people with your spines. A fruity leshy. You produce small fruits, you know, with primal magic. Uh, that that at, at dawn each day, these fruit ripen. And you can interact with them and, uh, you know, give them to living creatures to give them bonuses. It's like, here, have my apple. <laughs> the fungus leshy, uh, you know, which uh, you get uh, the fungus traits instead of the plant trait. Um, and you are better in dark areas with dark vision. Gourd les leshy got a gourd for a skull. Um, you can store stuff in your head. It becomes hard to steal things because you can hide things in your head. It's kind of silly, but I love it. Uh, leaf Leshy. You're made from natural foliage. Um, and you're good at falling. You take no damage from falling regardless of distance. You kind of fall with grace. Uh, the Lotus Leshy. You can float on water. Look at that one there. Uh, pine Leshy, you, you're basically a pine tree. You exclude sticky sap. Uh, you're better at climbing. 
Uh, the root uh, leshy is made from hardy roots that attach firmly to the ground. You get extra hit points and can go longer before you have to starve um, without sunlight. And it's harder to knock you prone. Seaweed leshy, um, you get a swim speed and can breathe underwater. You're good with you're the ocean. And of course, vine leshy, uh, you're better at climbing. Um, again, it's another similar. Pine leshy gives you like combat climber. Um, and this one is like you don't need to have any hands free to climb. Um, it, it, both of them give you uh, different bonuses. Um, you know, the pine one you're better at holding on to gear and climbing. The other one is just you're really good at climbing, uh, which is different bonuses for climbing. They are very different for dive it. That's your lashy there. Um, Age of Spirit. This is the thing here. You don't always remember your previous incarnations as a physical embodiment of the spirit. Uh, in this one, Age of Spirit, you remember more. Um, you can get some stuff from your past lives, basically. Uh, train proficiently in one skill of your choice when you prepare daily per day. Uh, so it's like, oh, you know, my past life had this skill. I'm going to use that today. Or this past life had this skill. I can kind of remember it. Better at climbing. Harmlessly cute. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can put a spear, you're, you're harmless. Lore, nature and stealth. Uh, some superstition, you know, with spirits and luck. Uh, hey, uh, seed pods that you can chuck at people. That's a really fun one. So, Leshy. They're kind of fun. You get some, like, uh, interesting abilities uh, that you can kind of add in there. Speak with kindred. I like that one. Uh, whatever kind of Leshy you are, you, uh, you know... Speak with plants or fungi that are close to you. If you're, uh, you know, fungus less, you speak with mushrooms or fungi. Gourds can speak with gourds, melons, and some are uh, fruiting plants. Leaf deciduous trees, vines with vines and climbing plants. Yeah, you know, so it's sort of like you can speak with plants that are similar to you. I like that one too. Look, I like the idea of a leshy. They're kind of fun, uh, and I think that's the thing is a lot of these ancestries are fun and interesting. Let's talk about the. Lizard folk. There's a lizard folk there. There's a lizard folk there. Um, so, they're lizard humanoids. <laughs> That's the best way to say it. Um, <laughs> again, that in a watery nose. They're adapted to many environments. They still prefer to being near uh, water because they can hold their breath. Um, they do prefer equipment that's not evenly damaged by moisture. Um, so like things like stone, ivory, glass, and bone. Um, they, they can, you know, move through other humanoid societies, especially more nowadays. Depending on their environments, you know, kind of depends on the type of lizard they are. They have various colors that aid them in camouflage for their environment. Some have dorsal spines or neck frills, depending on their clan lineage. Uh, they're six or seven feet tall. Um, and the thing is, they grow throughout their lifetime. They're reptilian. They are known as the Aruxi. Um, that's amongst themselves. That is the the actual name of their group. Um, they're communal uh, from the time they break out of their shells. They're big on oral tradition with epic poems, uh, uh, carvings, ancestral rites, uh, things with fossilized bones. They keep an eye on the future. Uh, a lot of them pastor astrologers, and um, you know they're they're known for their pa uh, patience. Um, the thing is, a lot of times, most of their settlements are the uh, migratory settlements that people think of outside regions when they think of Rooksy villages. The true ones are like partially or mostly submerged in water with very complex glass and stone structures that have generations behind them. So they have like larger cities and stuff or like small cities that exist in their culture. It's just the fact is that because of their nature being away from a lot of uh, other well, mammalian species, honestly, that they uh, and separation from that it makes them kind of a little bit more... You don't notice that stuff. You don't run into that stuff. Um, 
And the thing is, there are plenty of lizard folk that, or Rooksi that travel outside of their things. Things like bards, the source of broken oral tradition. Brains are Druid because of their connection to the wilderness. A lot of strength-based ones for barbarians, fighters, monks are great. Stealth, honestly, for a rogue because they do things. You know, and they do have spellcasters and stuff there, too. And they've got a deep history. There was ancient uh, Rooksi civilization that kind of existed way before some of the other ones, and they fell. That's something you can kind of look into. their ancient societies and histories, which is something that is respected upon. Uh, I played in Rooksi Bard. That my entire thing was to, uh, I left the Mwangi Expanse to learn more of where my ancient people migrated from because they came from Mwangi from somewhere else. And I wanted to learn more about that and our history in other parts of the world and from before the Mammalians uh, took over these places. That that was my character backstory. It was fun. I played one. I would recommend this. It was fun to kind of do that. Wisdom, Strength, and Free uh, for bonus abilities and intelligence for flaw. Um, they got an aquatic adaptation. You can hold your breath for long. You get the breath control general feat. And they get claws. Um, as for heritages, which they might have some more some ones I chose it back in the day when I was playing some second edition. Cliff scale, get combat climber. Um, you uh, come from an area that's very, um, uh, you're adapted to climbing gripping. I think I was a cliff scale, actually. Um, Cloud leaper, uh, you have a flap of skin that allows you to kind of uh, glide with it. Um, that uh, you can kind of catch, if you as long as have room, you can slow your fall. Uh, to enough avoid taking damage. You have to have room to do it because you kind of have these uh, flap of skin um, along your limbs that you can catch the air with. Uh, the frilled one, you've got this like frill that you can put out very um, Jurassic Park Dilophosaurus farm to kind of like uh, in demoralize your fool, uh, foes. Um, Sand Strider. You got fire resistance because basically you come from very um, hot areas. You come from deserts and stuff like that. The Unseen you've got some chameleon abilities. You can kind of blend in with your environment a little bit. Uh, Wetlander. Um, this is the uh, most common lizard folk heritage. You're com accustomed to aquatic environments. You get a swim speed. So most of Rooksi slash lizard folk are wetlanders. Not all of them. The majority of them. You know. Uh, and then Woodstalker. You've moved through forest and jungle very easily. Um, you can kind of use some abilities to take cover and go through the ter terrain better. When it comes to that. Consult the stars! Uh, you can get, like, uh, draw upon the insight of the uh, world, of the stars, and gain proficiency in one skill of your choice from a charisma, intelligence, or wisdom until the next daily preparation. The stars give me inspiration on something. Uh, you know, uh, you get a tongue that can flash out. Uh, lore, always a fun one. Marsh runner, move quickly through the, if you have a swim speed, you can move through marshy terrain quicker. Better claws, um, speak with reptiles, some sharp fangs, of course a tail whip, and of course ones that build up on those as you go. And, you know, you get better gliding and stuff like that, you know, uh, as you go um, longer farther. So there's a bunch of uh, things like here to look at. A lot of fun with Eruxi here, as a very interesting, the, the lizard folk. We might just do the uncommon and save the rare for another day, I'm thinking. Because we got uh, five more to go here. And then we do have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, we got enough that we can do a, a rare on its own. So let's uh, let's finish up for today with the uncommons. And then we'll just do rare another day so I don't go like four hours talking about these. Because honestly, it might end up being that way if I do that. <sighs> Nagaji. Serpent people. Uh, this is in a way, Pathfinder's um, answer to the Yanti. If you're thinking about that. Uh, there's some similarities that they are serpent people. They are still very different. Um, a much different backstory, a much different way that they go about it. The similarity of, they are snake people. Um, humanoid figures with serpentine heads, they're heralds, uh, serpent with powerful nagas. They were created by the goddess uh, Nevalanti, uh, who inspired both humans and Nagas. That's why they've got this devotion to Nagas that still exists today. They're sacred guardians. <laughs> anyway. So, some have tails along with their legs, some have sharp claws in their hands and feet. Uh, 
some are mark mistaken for Lamias rather than Nagaji. That's the thing. It's some are like that that they have that like bottom half of a serpent, top half of a person. The most common ones have a serpentine head and a humanoid body. Um, so ones that are like these are most common, but there are some unusual ones. Ones that have clawed hands, tails. The ones that kind of look like Lamias. Uh, Steels cover their bodies. Um, they're usually like looks kind of like snakes or nagas. Um, their neck could be positioned in like more like a humanoids that could have more like a swans kind of thing depending on their heritage. So there's a lot of variation in how they physically appear with this mixture of snake and humanoids. Um, and they vary. There's like ancient empires of Nagaji. There's fishing villages. You know, it's like <sighs> they're very they're more isolationists because of like you know differences. They have different physical needs from most of their ancestors. So they've integrated mixed communities. Um, there's a lot in their communities, too. It, it doesn't mean um, they haven't connected with others. They originated in the Tianzi region of uh, Nangajor. But they've spread throughout, uh, across Galarian, through, through like Veruda, Jamari. And they have so many traditions of their ancestor homeland, homelands. Um, so it's not like they have it spread other places in the world it's again they have one homeland that they've come from they've spread kind of they're matriarchal um so that's a big thing to say about it uh but not all of them trawl a suit with matriarchal societies um but they do still tend to trace their lineage through their mothers uh, um and almost no naga uh nagaji societies are strictly patriarchal um so there are a few but they're incredibly rare. Most of the time, they're either matriarchal or they've gone to, like, a anybody in part of it. But again, you still, like, trace your lineage through your mother. Your mother is still, like, very important to you. Uh, you know. Um, so. Let's talk about adventurers for a second. Um, because, you know, they're Naga-built built society... Or Naga ruled society, they have any backgrounds usually, depending on their thing. Outside the Naga realms, um, they've got kind of more different things. They've got strength bonuses, uh, the flexible minds that gives them bonuses in certain areas doesn't mean you can't play anything again. Um, most common reason for Naga adventures is to possess the Naga superior for the uh, benefit of a Nagaji community. Um, and after that, it's, you know, reason can be varied by any people in Galarian, you know. There's so many reasons why someone becomes an adventurer. There's general reasons from the society you come from why you become an adventurer. You come up with a lot of different ones after that. You get strength and free. You get really bonus of strength and free. So you get bonus strength and one other. Low light vision and you got fangs. You can bite with fangs. Let's talk your heritages. And then your feats. As a Nagaji. Hooded Nagaji. You look kind of like a cobra. And you can shoot venom from your mouth. Um, yeah, that's it. Kind of have the cobra hood and spit from it. Um, uh, the sacred Nagaji. This one. Uh, you stand out amongst the most uh, most Nagaji with the upper body of a human woman, lower part of a green or white snake. Um, you don't get the fanged on or attacked. You have a tail that does bludgeoning. Um, and then you got some other bonuses because you've got a snake on the bottom. So the thing is, you look, it's the one that looks like a Lamia. Um, you know, there's some legends behind it, whether they're true or not. Mm. Uh, Titan Nagaraji, uh, you know, much stronger muscles, scales as iron plates. Uh, your skills are medium armor and the plate group that grants you a plus four bonus to AC, dex cap of one, uh, and some other things there. That, and you have the comfort trait, so you can always rest while wearing it. Uh, you can never wear armor or remove scales. Uh, you can etch rune armor runes into your scales. So you can, like, etch runes into your scales because they're, like, so tough and armored. So Titan Nagaraji are, like, if you want to be an armored warrior Nagaraji for any reason, you could be. Honestly, you could be your armored warrior version of this as, uh, you know, whatever class. If you're not comfortably trained in your thing, that's another thing entirely. Venom Shield Nagaraji, um... You become inherently resistant to toxins. 
That's it. Your experience look. I went for Anarajarati. You have a flexible neck, uh, like striking pose of a snake. So kind of like that striking pose of a snake and kind of like uh, get some distance and uh, give a bit more reach with your neck to go and bite with it. So those are Anarajarati. And there we go. Uh, cold Pine Gate. Um, bonuses against emotional things and stuff like that. Lore, of course. Spell familiarity. A serpent's tongue, which you can kind of taste the air with an imper imprecise uh, scent. And water ones uh, that kind of like, you get breath control as a bonus feat, a little bit of a swim speed uh, that you've got connections to like a water noggin. So there you go. Maybe you want to swim a little bit. You don't get a really fast swim speed, you get a little bit of one. And you get breath control as a bonus feat. But those are the Nagaji, the serpent people, which again, very different than something like uh, D&D's Yanti, which is an evil snake race. Uh, that I mean, there have been rules to play them in other editions. I don't think 5th edition, though. Orcs! <sighs> Good old orcs. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things is like a lot of times there's been a lot of violence and conflict in their ancestry and in your and raised in him. And a test of strength. Challenging high member, uh, ranking members of your community for dominance, uh, seeking glory. Orcs struggle to succeed in success of other communities that could see them as brute. Um, because orcs have a fidelity and honesty that are unparalleled. That's an important thing because it's like the loyalty of an orc friend is large. You know, the an orc may have that, you know, uh, nature because of like the area they brought up with you know, of violence and battle, but they're honest warriors, you know? Um, doesn't mean they won't get into a fight with you for no reason. Uh, they'll just be like, yeah, you know, I don't like you, uh, and just get into a fight with you. They're often gladiators and mercenaries. Um, human settlements can sometimes not accept or communities because of the, a lot of these mindsets. You know, but... <sighs> It's they still can be. Um, Oak teaches that they're shaped by the challenges to survive, basically. Anyway, physically, you're tall, powerfully built, long, stocky arms, like around seven feet tall, uh, broad shoulders. Um, yeah, uh, they share sharing eye level with most. Uh, while Simon, yeah, so they're kind of like they're seven feet tall broad, almost bow-legged stance uh, with slouched shoulders that gives them eye level with most humanoids, though they are towering over them technically. It's kind of this weird thing. Rough skin, thick bones, hard muscles, big on war and stuff, a lot of battle scars, kind of green or grayish skin, um, you know. <sighs> Pain and glory define orc communities, mostly. That's one of those things about it. And it comes from uh, strength, family lineage, things like that that comes into it. And, you know, that's where we get into adventurers. Um, challenge, uh, the thing is because you're overcoming challenges and prove themselves, many become adventurers. Going out on your own. Um, uh, you know, and you might, uh, uh, you know, adventure with other orcs or other ancestries and stuff like that. Whatever reason, you've kind of set out on your own. And again, orc society is not really a, you know, it, it's not antithesis to other societies. That's why sometimes, hesitantly, um, has orc communities can be accepted in human settlements. Because they can work along with other species. It's just there's this, like, you know, very violence, battle competition, uh, fight each other kind of mentality and always improving yourself, always improving yourself against others, uh, challenging yourself mentality can lead to a lot of conflict between it. You know. Young orcs are typically rated by the entire community. And remember, twins, triplets, and quadruplets are quite common in families. Um, and young children die a lot during the child rearing years, unfortunately. Hmm. There is ritual sacrifice and tattooing in amongst some of them. Ah, depends on your, uh, places there. 
And there's feudal structure too. Uh, the Hold of Bedelkin is a large society. Uh, power changes quickly. One mighty orc dying uh, in battle can shake up the entire power structure uh, leading to battles between it. But the Hold of Bezel, uh, Be Be Belkazin is an orc territory. Uh, and again, some, you know, try to find their own war bands and go off their own territory. Da -da -da. Lock on that one. Strength and a free boost, and you get dark vision as an orc. Those are the big things you get it. Let's talk about orc heritage and orc feats. Because, you know. Badlands! You come from a scarred Badlands area. You can hustle twice as long. Environmental heat effects aren't as bad. You're from those areas that, you know, kind of driven to battle ready. Uh, descended from a long list of battlefield commanders. You train in intimidation. You get intimidating glare. Deep orc! Uh... Calloused hands and red eyes speak of your deep dark in the mountain caves. Uh, you get terrain expertise feet uh, for underground and combat climber. You're good underground. Grave orc. You're exposed to necromancy that should have killed you, but you lived. Um, King resistance to negative energy because uh, and necromancy effects. Because uh, you know what? Uh, turns out uh, death effects didn't work on you. Uh, some Sang Shung went, your soul is mine, and you're like, I hold on, I'm an orc. Oh, crap, what the hell happened to me? Uh, hold Scarred Orc. Uh, part of an orc community practices ritual sacri uh, uh, san sanctification or tattooing. Okay, I don't know. It's not sacrifice. Sanctification. Uh, so you marks on your skin, get extra hit points on the dark hard feet. Rainfall Orc. Uh, born in a rainforest. Uh, you know, um, you move through jungle terrains a little better. Uh, that's about it. And Winter Orc, you're from the cold climate. You got, you know, uh, better, you're trained to survival, treat cold effects, uh, cold environmental effects as they're less extreme. Uh, Beast Tamer. Look at that one. That's a nice one. Um, hey, Blaze. Uh, trained in nature and can train animal feats. Got Iron Fists, Orc Ferocity. Uh, you can kind of battle through, uh, avoid being knocked out and remain at one hit point when you be dropped in battle. Uh, but gain a wounded one condition instead. Get some orc lore, some superstition, weapon familiarity, a war mask. You can paint your face to create a war mask. Or you maybe have tusks. You can bite things. Superstition, of course, for like, you know, defend yourself against uh, magic for cultural superstitions. But there's your orcs. If you want to play an orc. Got three more we'll finish today, and then we'll leave the rare ones for next folk. For the next time. Let's talk about rat folk. I like the rat address there. See, these things display rat folk appropriately. Uh, they're the Yusuki, uh, as the rat folk call themselves. And um, they are a surface dwelling humanoid that are communal, prefer cramped conditions. Uh, they can live up to 100 individuals in a, in a given house. Uh, they live in caves and caverns and stuff like that if they can't find uh, homes and towns. They love to travel. Uh, they love. They often are on merchant caravans. They uh, have a keen eye to spot things out of the ordinary, and uh, they are hoarders. You know, that's about uh, Yusuke. They're rat folk, rat people. You know, they've got rat size. They have uh, um, whiskers, fur, hairless tail, large ears. They're about four feet tall. Um, Very considerably, you can have similar things between family. Um, you've got an instinct to maintain uh, cleanliness, uh, um, and reinforced in this. Uh, this also reinforces through their social strong social structure. You know, as a lot of people might consider rat folk dirty, diseased, they are actually big on personal hygiene, probably a lot more than any other uh, humanoid species uh, ancestry. You know, it's sort of like, oh, they're they're rats, they're dirty, they're dark. No, they're they're neat freaks, you know? It, it's, you know, and people also mistake them for wear rats. Um, so a lot of times they'll wear, like, hoods, gloves, long sleeves, tunics and stuff to kind of hide that fake. Because they look similar to wear rats. Wear rats are violent and dangerous a lot of times. Not always, but a lot of times they are. I mean, there's a bad stigma against them, you know? Air creatures like canthropes aren't usually that great. So, um, they're very communal and very cooperative. And they have a lot of communal games and stuff that they learn through that, um, 
having fanships and connections uh, with uh, ones outside of your family. You know, you, you connect with the community that you have. Traders and trinkers are a lot of people that go. They're big on the trade caravans, wagons. Oftentimes are, are uh, pulled by exception large rats, uh, which the Soki can speak with. And again, they've had discrimination against their culture. And um, there are bad actors, which unfortunately don't help that. But a lot of them try for good behavior in society to be the model ones, you know? and try to be models in the community that they're part of. They try their best to not live up to the bad actors or the discrimination that has, you know, uh, been there for generations, especially for connections because of bad actors. And honestly, things like, oh, they're rats dirty, oh, they're, you know, wear rats, that kind of stuff. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons. Maybe you want to explore or travel. Maybe you want to defend your family. There's a lot of reasons to become an adventurer for a uh, rat folk, a silky. And, you know... They do. You get Dex, Intelligence, and Free for Ability Boots. Strength is your flaw. You get Low Light Vision. Let's talk Heritages and your feats. Heritage. Uh, deep Rats. You live dip deeper underground than other rat folk. You gain Dark Vision. Desert Ones. Um, you've been in arid areas. You have a leaner build, uh, longer limbs, shorter fur. Uh, you have a longer uh, speed, uh, as you can run on all fours. Heat effects are, a lot, are less on you. Uh, long snout, impermise scent. You can smell a little better. Uh, sewer rat. You've been driven to the sewers beneath a settlement. You're immune to diseases like uh, to the disease filth fever, and uh, you're better against poisons because you've been driven to a place that's filled with diseases and poisons. Shatter rats. Um, so you lived in some very dark places underground. It's different than just living underground. You lived in the darkest places under uh, underground um uh getting dark fur your ancestors live in dark spaces underground uh you know a natural main uh earn nerves people you're better at intimidating people you kind of lived in those kind of like dark terrible areas uh sh snow rat you can live in cold areas get resistance to cold and environmental cold fix and of course tunnel rat you can squeeze through areas a little bit better compress your little small bones Get a rat familiar. Hey, pack rat. Um, you know, uh, you can fit extra bulk inside of a backpack or chest and travel with it. Um, you know, you can fit an additional 50% of listed bulk uh, capacity into one stage storage compatriots or vehicles. You're good at shoving. You are a master packer for a car ride. You know, it's like when you're going on vacation, you're packing the car and you're trying to like, you know, it's the it's the skill of packing the, the, the car correctly or something. That's what rat folk get. You can pack rat. You get cheek pouches. You can hamster things a little bit too. Uh, rat folk lore. Rat speak. Speak to rats. You know, uh, some interesting ones there. A vicious incisor. You can bite things. That's rat folk. They're a fun one to play too. Tengu, 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 Tengu. They are, of course, a crow people. So, um, they originally come um, from Tianjin. Um, they're equally at home in wilderness and dense cities, and uh, they have spread across Galarian in search of a better life, basically, from where they've been. Um, they brought their blade crafting skills from their homeland. Uh, there's a lot of maritime uh, work that some of them work in, as fishers, blacksmiths, jinx eaters, because again, like, they're believed to get rid of the bad luck on crew, uh, basically absorb misfortune as a crow person. So, you know, a ship might have a, in quotations, token teng uh, tengu, who's your jinx eater. Um, and, you know, having lived in Leviathan conditions, they tend to be non judgmental, uh, especially regarding social status. Uh, and associating with, like, you know, lawbreakers, but leads to, you know, they might side-eye you. They'd be like, you're like, hmm, all right, you know. So, they're, they're bird people. Um, sharp beaks, uh, scaled forearms, uh, lower eggs and in talons. Um, footwear doesn't really work with them unless it's very custom-made because of their talons. And they prefer open sandals or simply to go barefoot. Um, they're about five foot tall. Um, and they're very light, too, because, of course, they are a bird people. They have hollow bones. And some of them have vestigial wings that 
they don't really give them true flight, but they have them. They hatch from eggs or feathers for the first year. Um, they don't really leave home during that time. They get like a downy gray coat, and they come of age uh, as an adult around 15. Um, they use shed feathers at, in their tools. Uh, like they like to use their own shed feathers for quills for like things that they're doing for magic and stuff like that and um, Many of them will uh, dye patterns onto their feathers or talents too um, You know and it amplifies the body language they use uh, in aiding humans to understand their expressions So They're very social band together extended communities uh, with fam many families living in adjacent house uh, ha houses sharing the housework in cities, they also may contain members of other ancestries. Uh, you know, that's the thing is, they can adopt other people into their community. In, especially in large cities. If I'm in a large city, let's say like Port Peril, which is a fishing city, which honestly you're going to have a bunch of Tengu in Port Peril in, um, in uh, the Shackles. Talking about, you know, buccaneers there and stuff like that. They will probably have some other ancestries that live in the Tengu community and, and sh are shared with them. Um... Tengu children raised in the same unit consider each other siblings. You should forget which of them share biological connections. Basically, if you're in that entire area, if you're raised together, you're siblings, you know, kind of thing. Um, so the big divide are those between those that stayed in uh, TNZ and those that went across the world. Uh, those that are in the groups or migrated. Uh, roosting, of course, more traditional conservationists, preserving their culture, Migrating, uh, like to absorb the cultures of the various nations and supplements they call home and integrate it into their own one. So, so effectively, are you from TNZ? Are you from outside the world? Most Tengu adventurers tend to leave their ancestral homeland, whether it's those that are from the homeland that have left it because they have a pool to the world or those that are members of the migrating group. Kind of depends on, you know, where your ideals come from get dex in a free, low light vision, and you get a beak which you can peck the crap out of people with. You can bite them. So, dog tooth Tengu. In addition to the break, your, your beak has, your mouth has a number of vicious pointed teeth. Um, but, so, you know, your stronger bite. Uh, basically, like, you're a toothed bird. Um, if you want to know what that looks like, look up toothed birds. They were a thing that existed in the past. They don't really exist nowadays. Go look them up. You can see pictures of them online. The Jinx Tengu. Uh, you learn to a curse after curse, and now slide them off like feathers uh, off of rain. Uh, you succeed for throw against a curse or a misfortune effect. You get a critical success in soon. If you gain the doomed condition, you can gain a flat uh, d uh, check and reduce the doomed value by one if you make a check, basically. Um, a Jinx Tengu is probably one that people put on a ship, honestly. You're good against it. Mountain Keeping Tengu. Uh, you're from a te Tengu Aesthetics, uh, you know, connection with the spirit world and great beyond. Use c Disrupt Undead Cantrip as an innate one at will. Skyborn Tengu, especially light and uh, maybe rare Tengu with wings. Though your connection to spirits to the wind sky might be stronger than most. Slow you just sound through the air. Hey, you've got those wings and you can kind of fall without taking damage. Storm Toss, uh... You know, they say whether blessings from uh, Hei Feng, which is, again, ancient Tengu, or hatching during a squall, you're resistant to storms. Get electricity resistance. Talon Tengu, uh, your talons are as sharp as your beak. Do some, uh, you can attack with your feet, basically. Uh, wave Diver Tengu, uh, you can cut through the water like, uh, you can, like a bird flies through the air. You gain a swim speed. Basically, um, Penguin it. Uh, and the Skyborn gets Soaring Flight eventually, which is a ninth level one. Uh, grow power of magical wings or expand, uh, expand your existing ones. Uh, and you can gain some fly speed, you know, for a little bit. Uh, temporarily. Um, so hey, you can learn to fly eventually. For a little bit. As for first level feats, uh, Mariner's Fire. Um, you can Bruce Fame. Uh, squawk. You can, like, squawk like a bird. Um, you know, it, uh, you know... It, uh... Oh, it's when you critically fail a uh, deception, diplomacy, or intimidation check. <laughs> Those are non-Tengu. Oh, uh... Uh... It covers up a social football. <laughs> I love that. Oh, go oh my god, I understand it. So it's like, it's like you fail, uh, critically fail a, like, 
charisma based check. You're just like, Rawr! like act like a bird for a little bit, and people are like, what? <laughs> it just confuses them because they're not Tengu. Tengu lore, weapon familiarity, uh, uncanny agility. Uh, you know, a steady balance it gives you and stuff like that. Wax feathers. Uh, you know, better with water and stuff. Oh, Tengu. You know the Tengu language, too. They're a nice one. Let's talk the last one for the co uncommon uh, ancestries. Venara. We'll finish up today, then, with this one. And just because there's a lot of rare ones and we're going about two hours here, we'll save the rare ones for next time. And we'll talk about them at, at another date. But the Venera. They're monkey humanoids. That's the best way to describe it. Um, they're, they're humanoid monkeys. Um... They've got their short, soft fur, expressive eyes, long prehensile tails. Um, they're born from the monkey god, uh, Ragus Ambitions, long ago. You know, that kind of thing. If you, if you struggle between self-betterment and self-expression. Long prehensile hand, hand-like feet, uh, rarely more than five foot tall, looks usually look a little smaller because they're slight nimble builds, covered with fur, uh, various different colors. Um, yeah. There you go. So. They seek balance and comfort in their lives. Um, they're devout without being fanatics, tricksters without being malicious, daring without being foolish, curious without being obsessive. That's the kind of thing. They seek balance and comfort in their lives as a Venara. Um, they have a deep conne ancestral connections to uh, the deity which spawned them. Um, and they feel a, des uh, a, d a powerful desire to live in the grace of that god, you know, and wait in their history, pursuing enlightenment. Um, uh, those that live in Vudra uh, kind of uh, do for this kind of self knowledge and stuff like that. Hmm. <laughs> But again, like, their creator is an internal trickster. And, you know, they cherish the mischiefs and feats of folly, but they're also like, you know, we don't want to go as far as that thing of ourselves. You know, um, they do have a very impermanent nature, though, too, about the kind of thing. They kind of, like, move on a lot of times. There's, there's a very chaotic nature to them because of that. Eh, you kind of look into that a little bit more. Uh, you see greater insight in the nature of being. Uh, also, it provides them with peace and enlightenment. That's why I travel. Um, and again, all children are raised on the stories of uh, embellished tales of ancestors, Venera folk heroes, Jenner deities, um, and some of them want to emulate those stories that they're told as kids. Dexterity and free, get a pretensile tale! Uh... Can't require access to require fingers or manual dexterity, um, but you can perform interact actions with uh, requires a free hand with your tail, even if your hands are occupied. Let's talk heritage and feats. So, the the Bandage Venera, um, you know. You your family claims to be one descended from those that were peacekeeping family called the Badange. Uh, uh, Bandage. I think I got pretty close. They're the most common type of Venera. Um, you ignore difficult terrain from crowds. You're familiar with the traffics of civilization. Uh, the Lak Gyan Venara. Um, those that said were born in uh, Radya's image. Um... Uh, but they've only found service in the, uh, survival service of an enemy. Um, uh, they've sharp teeth, so you have a jaw. So, hey, look at that. You're born in your deity's image, but, uh, you know, have to be in the service of his enemy kind of thing. You know, found, uh, service, survival there originally. The Ragdion Vidara, on the other hand, um, born directly to the whims. Uh, you know, transpect that to that. Um, you gain one divine spell cantrip. That is a innate cantrip that you can cast. And the, oh boy, let's try to pronounce this here. Uh, Wajagand Venara. I probably butchered that one. 
Uh, go to admit that one. I definitely think I butchered. Um, so, yeah. Um, you're forced to labor by a Rakshasa, mortal Ravana. Uh, and uh, you're no long, uh, you're bound no longer, but that mark has left upon you. Get surface with most emotion effects. Stuff like that. So, hey, but not uh, of an R heritage. Just... I, I was just going to vouch for that. You get a climbing tail. Tail makes use of your climb. Um, weaponry, lore, of course. White capped. Um, you're a little shorter, and, uh, you know, you get steady balance. Hair on your head. Got to take it first level. Uh, you know, when you be fascinated or, or dazzled, kind of uh, put it a little bit off there. And canopy sight. Uh, gain low light vision, because you've been through a tree there. It is. So those, of course, are the Venara. And now, I am going to actually leave it here for now in this entire endeavor. I'll have to save for another time the rare entities. I was originally going to go through them today, but um, there's a lot of them. And I've gone through a lot of the ancestries here, a good not chunk of them. And I feel like I don't want to get these episodes to be super, super huge. You know, I want them to be a decent chunk where those of you that are here live on Twitch are having a very enjoyable time. And those of you that catch this on YouTube can also just not have to sit there the like forever. It's a long episode. I'm, you're learning about a lot. You can kind of go about that. I should really create like cutoffs where these things are at, but I'm probably going to be lazy and not do that. So apologies to that. I may throughout those times. I might not. Might list them. Especially for these guides, oh, I probably should do that. Anyway, <laughs> every Tuesday and Thursday we talk tabletop. Whether it's Pathfinder 2nd Edition or various other tabletop things, we dive into topics here on Twitch. It goes up on YouTube eventually for you to check out. I hope you enjoyed today learning about the uncommon ancestries you can play in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. We will hit up those rare ancestries at some point too, soon. There are very there are a bunch of more interesting ones that are definitely a lot harder because they don't they're they're rare. The thing is they show up either in one region in Galarian or there's just so few numbers of them that you don't find them. And especially when it comes to players being them adventurers, you know, they that's the thing is I can play that. I'm just rare. I am maybe in a place I'm at, I could be the only example of what I am for hundreds or thousands of miles. I could have no connection to my people anymore because I've reached this area. And that does mean a lot of different things about it. That could mean a lot of different things. As we've seen, it's unfortunate that in a very global, very multiple species world like Galarian, there still tends to be preconceived notions. Things like the rat folk and orcs can oftentimes get that. Orcs earn that reputation a little bit more. Gnolls, certainly, some of them earn that reputation. But again, those from Mwangi don't really deserve the reputations they get. They earn it through some of their actions, but their actions make sense. The orcs have their way of doing things. And again, their way of doing things is very different. The rat folk just don't deserve the rat they get, unfortunately. Poor rat folk. Uh, and a lot of others, you know, it's like when you get to these more uncommon ones, especially because there are a lot of animal-based humanoids or very unusual ancestry humanoids, there tends to be a lot more preconceived notions to them, prejudices against them. You can earn away from that. And it's the thing is, it's like a lot of Galarian societies, if they learn about you, will get rid of those preconceived notions, those prejudices. Those aren't super ingrained uh, like, like some societies can be. But, you know, they're there, and they can have work to get rid of them. It's, it's a thing. It's, uh, everybody feels differently. You sometimes have to deal with crap. And, uh, you know, just have to recognize, especially because I think that's why, if I am a GM, before someone would play one of these uncommon ones, or ones that have some musician, if someone came to me and says, I want to play Noel, I would talk to them about it and talk to them about, like, hey, there will be prejudices against your character because you're choosing to play this. Or, or problems in your society because you're choosing this. If I'm playing a gnoll, if I'm playing a hobgoblin, if I'm playing an orc, if I'm honestly the poor rat folk who, you know, get the short end of the stick because they're rat people. And honestly, because of where rats the Lycanthrop, they give them a problem. So it's these things that, like, create these issues that you as a player will have to be ready to deal with 
you got to warn them to deal with it, and, and talk to them about it before they choose to play that. If they don't want to deal with that kind of stuff, don't play it. Or, you know, if you want to, they're like, hey, can, can we be from an area I'm, like, if, if we're in an area I am familiar, maybe you're the exception that has taught people what it is like to be your people and that you are accepted in this area. You could work that out with your GM. If someone said to me, it's like, hey, I want to have been existing in this town. I'm a null. I want to have lived here for like two decades in this town. Um, certainly, travelers might have notions about you, but the general people of that town will have learned about you and know that you are an exception to what others might have as notions from your people. And maybe you can explain to them what stuff about your people. And there's things you can develop in this. And this entire thing that I'm talking about now is going to come up more, especially with the rare ancestries, because they are rare. Because there are so few of them in comparison. Because they don't exist to the same degree as any of the other ones. I mean, like, honestly, some of the ones on here are very alien and different from a lot of the other species. So you get a lot of these issues. Anyway. That'll be another time we'll talk about that, but just keep that in mind when you're looking at uncommon uh, ancestries. It's something to talk about with your GM. How much is it? Is it a thing that I'll have to worry about? Is it a thing you don't want to worry about? Your GM, if your GM approves your uncommon ancestry, they might just pass it off. Honestly, say like, hey, this is, everybody here knows you. You're fine. You know, you're not going to worry about it. You're already accepted. Something like that. It can be character development and development for NPCs but it's a thing that should be discussed. Anyway, enough of that. I'm going to get going. Remember, check out all the links, both in uh, Twitch down below or in the description in YouTube. Um, I got Patreon. I got the YouTube. I got the Twitch. Uh, Dracovan Empire for both YouTube and Twitch. Check them out. Tuesday, Thursdays, talk tabletop. That's it. Um, hey, I'm going to get going. I'm going to say farewell to all of you out there. I hope you enjoyed learning about these different ancestries and saying to yourself, Maybe I'm going to play one of them. Maybe I don't. It's a thing to think about. Anyway, farewell, all of you out there, and goodbye.